today on Mother Mayhem. I think an element of this that makes it hard when we're talking about your dad is that you daughters, a part of you get your dad. You may never relate to the dude who chooses the narcissistic wife over his kids, and that may never make sense to you, but you do know what it's like to be on the receiving end of your mom's. You do know how much strength it takes to stand up to her and how beaten down by her someone can get after years and years of that abuse. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for Daughters. Hi, I'm your host, Heather Gray, and wow, today's episode is such an important one. I also have a feeling that for many of you, it's going to be hard to listen to because you'll be hearing your own story as you listen to the stories shared by the women today. Our little show here has only been out for eight weeks at the time of this recording, and already, I've received three letters from women who were first emotionally abandoned by their mothers and then emotionally abandoned by their enabling fathers. The trauma of the mother wound only becomes more intense with each adult who fails to keep you safe. This episode's going to be a doozy. I need you to remember everything I've said in previous episodes. You want to listen in on your own time and at your own pace. You want to take breaks when you need to. You want to be able to pause, move away, come back when you're ready, or give yourself permission not to come back at all if it just becomes too much. You always get to say when, you always get to say where, and you get to say stop. Remember, too, that you can always breathe your way through it. You can ground yourself. One thing that might help some of you as you listen to this is to listen with a notebook in case this brings up feelings or things and thoughts of your own that you find need attention. And I've been hearing from a lot of women that sometimes these topics get so close to them that they shut down they stop listening, or they seemingly leave their bodies. This is your trauma brain protecting you. You might be feeling in your body that it's okay to listen and that your trauma brain is just on heightened alert, and it's okay to cue your body to relax, to tell your brain, I know you're protecting me, but I know that nothing bad is going to happen by listening to this and I have the skills to protect myself. Trauma brain kicks in sometimes on automatic pilot. It doesn't always know that the coast is clear. So sometimes you do have to assure your body that it's safe before you're going to be able to relax. So just remember as you listen, you get to say when, you get to say where, you get to say how much, and you always get to say stop. Now, admittedly, I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous here because what I'm going to try to do is include three separate letters into one single episode. And I don't want any of the women writing in feeling like they've all been smushed together. And I don't want you to feel like I'm lumping you all in together or I don't want to end up being guilty of overgeneralizing anything. And I'm hesitant to have you all share this space together because I think so much about being the daughter of a narcissist is that you were often forced to share space, to make yourself smaller or to otherwise dim your light. And I am not at all looking to do that here. I am just trying to find my way to do right by the show. And I want to do right by you but I don't want any of you to have to wait needlessly or stay in pain longer than you have to just by doing one episode at a time because that doesn't seem like the right answer either. So I am going to read these letters one at a time. I'm going to offer you each some quick thoughts to each of you. 
And then I'm hoping to open the discussion to a wider lens. And if you were listening in last week, you already know I called you the Golden Girls. I can't be the only one in this community who finds solace and calm in their banter, their love, and their support for one another. So here we go, Golden Girls. You have a whole community of women listening in who are in it with you, and I certainly am too. So first we have Dorothy. Dorothy writes, Dear Heather, I found your podcast recently, and I'm so grateful for the content you offer in each episode. I'm 47 years old, and I have been struggling with this battle my entire life, but I think most of the difficulty has been in the last 20 years when I started a more adult life with marriage, divorce, no surprise there, and a child. And in my 30s, I tried a period of no contact. I had off and on patterns of communication of late, and I really struggle with how to interact because of the constant hurt and disappointment once I try again. I am now in one of the most solid and loving relationships I've ever had, and that Navigating Relationships episode really helped me think through some important things. My partner really deeply tries to support me, and I feel he understands. I told him about this podcast and we listened together, and he wants me to try therapy, but I just haven't found the right therapist who can unpack all the trauma wounds and relate it to my life in a way that helps me understand and move forward. So I really want to thank you for all of the information and strategies and guidance. I sometimes feel like you're talking straight to me. One of the areas I hope you might cover in a future episode is the enabling father. Because of my mother, my father and I have become more estranged. He can't stand up for me out of fear of her and his loyalty to her from her control has blinded him and sedated him, especially in his later years. As a child, he and I were close and he was a source of safety for me. He's very kind and gentle, but he never really stood up against her rage or her abuse or her silent treatments, controlling, and manipulative behavior. Now he's cut me off and is completely beholden and shackled to whatever way my mom goes. Another area of interest related to trauma and not feeling attached, loved as a kid, is how addiction plays into it. I am sure I am not alone in saying that I have struggled with addiction most of my life, especially alcohol. I've been successful professionally and feel that I live a good life, but there are patterns for sure, and I think that this is often a problem with many people who have had trauma and abusive childhoods. Thank you again, Heather. I look forward to listening more and appreciate all you do. Whew. Okay, Dorothy, I feel this and I get it. When you're young and your mom is acting out or playing games, your father probably had an easier time distracting you or pacifying you. You wouldn't have had words for what was happening, so your dad could probably have an easier time just getting your mind off of it. But then as you get older, you had words for your experiences, and your dad was probably more worn down by your mom, connecting this to his own shame for not protecting you, feeling unsure as to how to navigate it all given your mom's wrath, So often people, and not just fathers who side with the narcissist because there is a bigger consequence if they don't, in a lot of ways, you were the one who it was easier to disappoint or it was easier to let down. So he would choose your mom over you. It's possible too that your mom overt or covert methods to control your dad and his reaction to you. So while your dad stayed as close as he could to you for as long as he could, it's likely that he rarely spoke ill of your mom, and he likely never validated your experience of her, and likely it's true that he never allowed you to talk about your experience with your mom. Without any kind of ability to outwardly express the stories you were creating in your own head and then having them corrected, You likely internalized your experiences. You found your own coping methods for not dealing with it and making sense of it. And alcohol has become one of them. And Dorothy, I am going to devote our entire next episode to this. I think it deserves the time and attention all on its own. If I combine the alcohol story 
with the story about enabling fathers, it's not going to get the attention it deserves. So you and I are going to be talking more about this next week. I am going to cover the alcohol piece entirely in depth next week. Because that for sure is a common struggle that daughters of narcissistic moms have. And I really, really do want to help you recover from that part as well. So hang tight. I've got you and you certainly do have other women listening in and keeping you in company with your struggle as well. Now we get to meet Rose and Rose writes, Hi, Heather. I want to thank you for your podcast. I've been carrying it close to me as a journey through my days. Your words are good medicine and are helping me navigate this chapter of my life. I'm an only child. I was raised by my mother who stayed home to raise me. I was always uncomfortable around her and had a felt sense that something was wrong. But my dad always sang her praises and encouraged me to take care of her and help her feel better when she was down, which was really often. I suffered through my young adult years and all the way into my 40s with that relationship. When I finally started to set boundaries with her and reached out to family members for support, my dad sent me an email telling me that I was the worst thing in his life and that he needed distance from me. He often stands as her spokesperson when she is feeling sad or down. It's been almost four months since I've had contact with either of my parents. It's what they've asked for, which I know is a gift. But I'm walking around feeling like an abandoned child. I struggle with perfectionism and overperforming at my job. I have high levels of anxiety and I feel hyper vigilant most of the time. My husband doesn't understand what this is like. I feel completely alone. I've got no family left. And I am trying in every way I know how to be a better mother than I had to my child. But I'm shattered inside. My narcissistic mother is going through my ex-husband to continue to see my son, even though I have asked her not to. This makes it feel like a constant re-traumatization. I can't protect him from what happened to me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your podcast. I would appreciate any suggestions or guidance. Thank you for making the show. God damn, Rose, this just hurts. <laughs> Plain and simple, this just fucking hurts. You're not just walking around like an abandoned child. You are an abandoned child. This doesn't just change because you've lived into adulthood. What you are going through, it's not normal. It's not normal to be tossed aside by not one, but by two parents. And your reactions and your feelings about this are entirely normal reactions to a series of awful, painful, normal events. So very sorry that this is your story and that this is the burden you're carrying with you as you move through your days. It is unbelievably heavy for sure. I so wish that someone had the cojones to stand up for you, to take your side and speak out against your mom. So many choose to forsake the daughter in favor of making things easier for themselves. And I hear too, so often, spouses don't understand. And for many, this is true, especially if they were raised in healthy, well-adjusted homes. They don't relate to a mother turning their back on their daughter, and instead they're more likely going to relate it to the school bully. So they're going to want to say, don't focus on them, just focus on me. Who cares what they think? And what spouses and close friends fail to understand is that emotional abandonment by a mother and or a father has a pro found effect on the stories we create about who we are. If not only our own mothers could love us, who else possibly could? If not even our own father could protect us, who else possibly would? Well-meaning friends and family, they're just going to want you to pivot your head and look at a different direction and forget about the people 
who didn't choose you and focus on the people who are choosing you. But for you women who have not been chosen by your primary caretakers, intellectually, you might know that that's true, but it's so hard to feel that way. Another problem with really well-meaning friends and spouses is that we often want to be seen as enough of a replacement for the neglectful parents. I know I've been this way with my best friend. Her family is awful to her, and I just want to rescue her away from all of them. I want her to spend every Christmas with me and forget all about them. I want to love her so much that she doesn't need their love. I want to be her chosen family. In a lot of ways, I already am. But alas, that pull from her own family, it's so intense. And no matter how awful they are, they still get to have her for Christmas. And it's not always that the people around you don't understand. It's that they struggle with wondering why they aren't enough to replace the people who didn't deserve you in the first place. I can also tell you it is really hard to watch my friend go back to an empty well time and time again. After all, this is what I do for a living. She has her own therapist. (laughs) She has a built-in therapist in me as a best friend. And still she wants that connection with her biological family. And Only those of you in it are going to understand the pull that that has and what that's like. And it might be okay that your husband doesn't understand or your spouse doesn't understand so long as he simply knows that you're hurting and he's willing to help you take care of that hurt. Now, I've spoken in previous episodes about what it means to have a trauma-informed relationship And it just might be that your spouse needs to be more trauma-informed in order to truly understand. And if he's willing, maybe he'll listen to some of the episodes of the podcast with you or for you to have that awareness. I think it's episode four where we talk about relationships might be a good one for him. But I think it's such an important reminder for all of you not to confuse someone not understanding you with not loving you. Some of you may very well have simply attracted invalidating people who repeat your childhood patterns into your life. Some people in your circle may never understand because they're just like your emotionally absent parents. And if so, you're going to have some work to do there. But for many of you, you have people in your life who just don't get trauma. And this show might help them understand you better, even if they don't need it for themselves. Now, (laughs) let's get to know Blanche a little bit here. Here's what Blanche has to say. My mom is a covert narcissist. Her love was and has always been conditional. She has never once in my life admitted fault or apologized to me. I started my own therapy about a year ago, but what really made everything come to a head was finally me being fed up with how she treated my kids, most specifically my daughter. I couldn't stand up for me, but I can stand up for her, and so I did. I told her I couldn't accept how she was treating them and laid out a boundary. This led to her attacking me and calling me childish. I know there can't ever truly be a repair, and my trauma brain tells me, maybe it wasn't that bad. Maybe you're over-exaggerating. Just find a way to make up. My dad has reached out to me, but the first way he did was to say I owed her an apology. My dad is more reasonable and mature with me, but he defends her. He's trying hard to make a repair, and I do love him, but when he defends her and it doesn't stand up for me, it makes me feel like he might as well be her. I keep hearing your voice say, just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it. That's a paraphrase. Actually, Blanche, you got me down pretty good. I know I should be, and I'm so mad at my mom that it's easy for me to cut her off in a way, but with him, it's hard, and I'm just sad. Thoughts? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Blanche, we're only a couple of handfuls of episodes into this show. And I have to tell you, it just, it means so much to me that you're already hearing my voice in your head as you think about these things. I had no idea what the show was going to become when I decided to press record. And the idea that someone is stopping to reconsider the stories that their trauma brain is telling them and replacing them with something that I have said, I just have to be honest that it means everything to me. We really are creating this community of women who are working through narcissistic abuse recovery together. You're not just listening and relating to it. You're carrying it with your days. You're taking meaningful and intentional action. And gosh, I, I just, I feel that so deeply. Thank you so much. So let me be clear here and let me say, it really was that bad. And I believe you. Something that's true for you and everyone else listening is that you wanting to do something, not wanting to do something, wanting to say something or not wanting to say something, that is reason enough to say something, do something, say something, not say something, not do something. It never has to be more bad or more awful. Your reasons, your preferences, your comfort, all of those things are reason enough to set whatever kind of boundary you need to set. It might feel wildly unfamiliar. It might feel strange. You might be wondering if this thing is on, if you're doing it right. And all of those thoughts and feelings you're having are normal because all of this is so very new to you. So you're getting your reps in. If you think about driving or a new sport, how any of that felt the first couple of times you did it before you got the hang of it. The fact that it feels strange or you might be out of practice with it, it doesn't always mean you're heading in the wrong direction with any of it. And I really like how you're thinking about this, that it can be hard and it can still be the right thing to do because that for sure is true. However, I think an element of this that makes it hard when we're talking about your dad is that you daughters, a part of you get your dad. You may never relate to the dude who chooses the narcissistic wife over his kids, and that may never make sense to you, but you do know what it's like to be on the receiving end of your mom's. You do know how much strength it takes to stand up to her and how beaten down by her someone can get after years and years of that abuse. Because you've been on the receiving end of your mom too, it can be really hard to think about setting a limit on your dad or saying no to him because a part of you knows that his life hasn't been that easy for him either. So your empathy might get in the way of seeing him in the same category as your mom. You might find yourself wanting to cut him more slack or allow for some caveat in the discussion. And I totally get that. And it makes sense. But hopefully as I start to dig a little bit deeper into this discussion for all of you, you're going to find some insight that's going to help you understand your feelings, validate your experiences, and find your boundaries. Because I'm about to go a little bit deeper right now. Before I do, just a reminder that you got to do a gut check on these things about how you're feeling and whether or not it's okay for you to continue to listen. Listening to other people's stories, hearing your own story reflected back, it is not for the faint of heart. It is okay to slow this down and it is okay to go easy. So let me first say for our golden girls here, <laughs> I love that I call you golden girls, as well as everyone listening, just as we've talked about different kinds of narcissistic mothers with different kinds of manipulative tactics and tendencies, there's a whole range of fathers who tend to respond to these scenarios. Not every dad is going to respond in the same way. So our golden girls, they all had these enabling fathers. And that's what we're going to be talking about directly today. But anyone listening, if you want to share your father's story about how it's affected you, you're always welcome to share your story or your question with me, just like these women did with me. And you can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. We have our enabling fathers, which are going to get the bulk of our attention today. 
Some dads are going to respond differently. Some fathers might be what we call like the absent or neglectful dad. He let that shit happen and he looked the other way and just left your mom in charge. For some of the moms in this scenario, this checked out tendency that they had is a part of what led to or contributed to narcissistic behavior. She likely got attracted to your dad because he resembled how she grew up when she was maybe abandoned by her dad or her mother, just like she was in childhood. And so she's passing those dysfunctional patterns down as a way of being in your family. And I think a lot of enabling dads also fall into the category that we call victimized dads. And I referred to them earlier when I implied the kind of dad that was so beaten down by your mom's manipulation and behavior that he ends up caught in his own trauma cycle. He can't take care of himself, so as a result, he can't take care of you. And he might be dysfunctionally attached to your mom out of fear or emotional blackmail. When I have to tell you, I've worked with these kinds of dads before. And they've been clients of mine. And many tell me that their wives would take compromising pictures or they would edit photos or videos or recordings that would make them look bad. And then they would threaten them with court or threaten to take the kids if they ever did anything to step out of line. This traumatizes these men because they know that they abandoned their daughters But they also feel like they did the best they could by staying in your lives in whatever capacity because these women really did, your mother really did have them believing that the court wouldn't believe them or that she had the power to keep the kids from him altogether. Some dads, they don't always respond with this meek acquiescence. They might become angry or enraged. So the conflict and the tension in the house actually ends up getting escalated. The mom might end up looking justified for her behavior and then is seen as even more of a victim. Watching both of your parents unravel, that's going to make the kids feel like no one's in charge, that they can't depend on anyone. They're going to end up feeling like orphans inside a two-parent home or family. The other thing is, too, trauma begets trauma. Some narcissists Marry other narcissists. So some dads all but replicate the same shit the mother's doing. So if one parent isn't popping off about something, the other one is. And this is debilitating for the children in this kind of home because they're only being offered this one toxic or dysfunctional way of moving through the world. And I hate this, but honestly, the story that I hear far too often is the dad who leaves the kids with the dysfunctional and toxic mother. He can't get you all out, or he's threatened to believe that he can't get all of you out, and as a result, he gets himself out, and he separates from the family. Getting away from your mom means getting away from you. And it's rarely intended, but the unfortunate byproduct of a man who opts out of dealing with the toxic, as a result, opts out of relationships with his kids. They choose not to fight your mom for you. They believe they would never win. As a result, they just leave. (laughs) I was trying to think of how to categorize these kinds of dads, and I just decided to call them the I don't know what the fuck to do dad. You're not going to find that in any clinical book or self-help book on the topic of narcissism and families. But shit, I got to tell you, man, I I see this one a lot. And this is the dad who's so befuddled by what they're seeing, hearing and experiencing that they're rendered helpless. And they end up in this chronic pattern of fight, flight, or freeze. And they never get to the point where they can function for any kind of length of time. And these dads, they might enable at some point. They might create conflict or distance at other times. And they might try to fight the system sometimes, but you might experience this kind of dad as wildly unpredictable and never safe because they vacillate all over the place. And as the daughter, you're left confused and you're not going to trust him. You're going to feel traumatized and you're going to feel scared. And all of this is really hard. 
whatever kind of dad you had, this is just really hard. So we want to sit with that for a second, because after going through that, odds are, I probably described here, anyone's dad who's listening, and all of you have really, truly been through a lot. And it's likely that your self-esteem has taken a gigantic hit and that it's hard to trust yourself. So, of course, you're second-guessing your limits and second-guessing your boundaries. Of course, those kind of questions are going to come up. You're even more likely to question your boundary when you realize it's not just going to cost you your mom, but it's likely also going to cost you your relationship with your dad or other extended family members as they're forced to decide which side they're going to fall on. And if your dad is so in the web of your mom that he can't see your perspective, if he's become the mouthpiece for her abusive comments and is holding you to some absurd standard, it doesn't actually matter that this is likely because of his own trauma. Trauma doesn't excuse anyone from bad behavior. You don't get to get away with shit just because you've been traumatized, and he doesn't get a get-out-of-jail-free card for being emotionally inept. Rather, he's showing you who he is. He's showing you what he is and isn't capable of, and he's showing how much he is willing to do or not do for your relationship with him. And we have to believe him. We're not going to try to change him. We're not going to try to get him to see your side. We're going to believe him and choose to do whatever you must in response to that. We believe him because in his response or in his lack of a response, he is showing us that he has been rendered incapable of making a healthy choice for himself and for you, his kids. He may want to, he may wish he could, but still your mom's pull is too much. Now, if we remove this idea that your dad is deliberately not choosing you, now that we see that he's likely incapable of any kind of healthy relationship, what do you want? So just like telling your narcissistic mother your side of the story could have little to no impact on changing her mind, behavior, or treatment of you, unfortunately, the same is going to be true about your dad. He's incapable, so you're going to have to believe him. And as a result of believing him, how much space do you find yourself needing from him? What is your boundary? Are you going to set a new one with him? or on your own with him, you get to do that, and you really might have to. If your dad has checked out until you meet your mom in her perspective, it's wise just to stay gone. However, keep in mind that your dad doesn't just get to check in and out of your life as he sees fit. He doesn't get to disconnect from you and then be all entitled to a relationship with his grandkids, for example. And I know that this is such a sensitive topic for all of you listening. And I keep getting letters where I hear, I have no relationship with my mom or dad, but they want a relationship with my kids. And with younger kids, you don't owe them a relationship with your kids. You are not depriving them or taking away their grandparents' in any kind of penny retaliation. If you opt out of allowing your kids contact with their grandparents, you're doing that because you're setting the boundary for your kids, and it's the boundary that your father should have set. You're not being petty. You're not withholding. You are keeping known abusers away from your kids. And I know that some of you won't see it that way. And some of you are going to feel that it's totally fine with your kids having a relationship with your parents, even if you don't. And if that works for you, it works. But I've seen so many women, they're breaking their own hearts and they're giving themselves away in the trauma and in the sadness that comes from watching their parents with their kids. 
And this is true if they see that their parents are better as grandparents. And this is true when their kids just come home confused by the unpredictability and the same mixed messaging as you are. What's important here is getting control of the situation and into the driver's seat of that decision. Now that your dad has shown himself to be this way and engage in this pattern of behavior, what do you want to do? What do you need? It's more than likely that you're going to need to grieve. This is all so sad and so painful when your dad sees the abuse and chooses not to protect you. And just as you've grieved for the mom you didn't get and always deserved, you're going to need to grieve the father that you never had and always deserved too. And sometimes when I work with daughters, the loss of dad gets cast aside because he wasn't as overt in his dysfunction, but his absence and failure to protect you can leave an indelible mark on your life. And you're going to want to grieve that. You're going to have to grieve that. You need to see those feelings through. So you're going to journal about them. You're going to release them. You're going to keep talking about them. And maybe you need to write your dad a letter that you never send. Maybe you need to write him more than one letter that you never send. Maybe you need to craft a voice memo talking to him, telling him off, sharing your story. If your dad has proven himself incapable of hearing it, don't give him your vulnerability. He hasn't earned it. Instead, share with someone you trust, a friend, a therapist, anyone who can hold and honor your truth. And just as we've talked about reparenting our inner child in previous episodes, I really think that anyone raised by a narcissistic mom and enabling dad is going to need a committed practice of reparenting themselves. This inner child and reparenting thing, it's about as psychobabble as I get, honestly. I didn't even buy into it at first. But my own mom died when I was six. So as you might imagine, I've been in my own fair share of therapy over the years. And the whole inner child thing never worked for me. So I never really tried it before with my clients. But these days, I've really worked to make it look different so I can wrap my brain around it and help my clients wrap their brains around it too because there is a lot of evidence-based research supporting these kinds of interventions. So for you, doing inner child work might mean that you're visualizing yourself as a little girl and you're watching yourself protect her. And when you think of your dad and how he's spoken to you and treated you, what do you want for that little girl? What does she deserve? Your adult brain and your high tolerance for pain might think that you can offer your dad compassion but that might also be the people pleaser in you talking. Do you want that little girl responsible for your dad and his feelings? Do you want her putting him on the top of her list? Do you want him thinking his narrative as her truth? And whatever you want for her should be what you want for yourself. In offering your adult self the same thing, you are healing the childhood wound and giving yourself the love you always deserved. Something else that can sometimes help is when you write your inner child a letter. So you might want to write your younger self a letter and fill it with compassion and support and understanding and encouragement. And you're going to want to validate the little girl's emotions. You want to see her pain and promise to protect her from more. Gosh, it can be incredibly powerful when you do that. It might also feel gutting and like you're severing an artery. And it might make you feel like you're just opening yourself up to this world of hurt. But what you're also doing is you're letting in love, you're letting in healing, and you're letting in the acceptance that you for so long have been denied. And now as I say this all out loud and start to walk you all through it, I'm realizing um, that these skills are probably good ones to add to my slow and steady toolkit for narcissistic abuse recovery. So I'm going to go ahead and add them into that document for your reference, and I'm going to link to it in the show notes for today's episode. 
So golden girls, as you listen, you might need to do some work on yourself about what your boundaries look like with your dad. You're so used to thinking of your mom as that squeaky wheel. So perhaps your dad, maybe he slid under the radar in that conversation that you had with yourself. But if he's coming at you, if he's blaming you, denying your truth, showing you that he is emotionally limited and thus requires boundaries himself, then they might need to be the same ones you've had with your mom. They might be more nuanced, but whatever is right for you will be right. Here are some things you might want to think about and consider. Some of this might be true for you. Some of it might not be. But your past experiences with your dad should absolutely inform your future interactions with him. Don't expect him to be any kind of different. You're going to want to know what actions and behaviors you're no longer willing to tolerate. You're going to want to be assertive and direct in your communication. You're going to want to remember that clear is kind. So say no and set limits and get practice at doing this without feeling guilty. (laughs) That last part I know is going to take some work, but with practice, you'll see you start to feel more confident and you start to feel way less guilty. You're going to want to know and be aware of your own triggers, reactions, and sensitivities that lead to these boundary challenges. So you're going to want to make note of them And when they happen, give yourself that time to think and respond. You don't always have to respond to everything right away in the moment that it happened. You're always allowed to stop, process, think things through, feel the feelings through, and then come back and decide where you land with it. You're all going to want to get some support with this on your journey. And Golden Girls, if you all want to stay connected, I love calling you Golden Girls. If you all want to stay connected so you can talk further about this, let me know and I'll connect you. Um, Someday, I have to be honest as I say this out loud, someday I really hope I could get to build this live community for all of you to connect and share. For now, I can be the connector and the, the friend maker, the matchmaker. I don't know what you would call it. But if you want to stay connected, let me know and I'll, I'll get you guys hooked up. You're all going to want to work on challenging your inner critic as well as detaching yourselves from your dad's opinions of you and what you're doing, not doing, saying, not saying. You're going to want to challenge that inner critic at every chance you get. And you're going to want to work on removing yourself from the grip that your dad and his opinion has on you. You're going to want to get clear on the contact and communication you are willing to have with your dad going forward. Once you've thought all this through, it's likely that you're going to have a clearer idea of what kind of relationship you want to have with your dad going forward. And if you don't know yet, that's okay. This stuff really does take time. But when you do, get clear with yourself. Communicate it clearly and be consistent in your response if your boundaries are just skipped over again. Now, Dorothy, as I said earlier, you and I are going to be connecting more next week. And I'm going to be addressing your relationship with alcohol in a more in-depth way then. But as I rescan your letter, I feel really confident that the discussion about the enabling father and your experience there has largely been covered and discussed today. And I hope that I've given you some thoughts to think about with that. And Rose, I really specifically want to take a second now to address the anxiety, hypervigilance, and overperforming tendencies that you talked about. I don't want those to get lost in the shuffle. So first, I want you to hear me say and remind you that you are grieving. There is so much about your life that makes you so very sad. And in that sadness, you likely have a lot of internalized beliefs about what it means to be good, how to keep people in your life, and how to not be abandoned. Overfunctioning is a coping response, and at some point, It worked for you, and now you're starting to realize that it doesn't. Stopping that overfunctioning is going to mean breaking the habit 
of doing so. And Rose, you're going to want to pay particularly close attention to those inner child exercises that I just walked you through a little bit ago. I'm also going to encourage you a little bit here to help you recognize how hypervigilance in some way has served you. That was your trauma brain wiring you for risk. So you likely need to get in the habit of telling your trauma brain that it's okay to simmer down now, and that rest is okay, and that good really is enough. You're going to want to check in on your expectations of yourself. And would you expect that little inner child, that little inner girl inside you, what would you expect of her? And those become the expectations you hold of yourself. I want you to adjust those expectations because I suspect, Rose, that after being abandoned by both parents, that you probably have gotten trapped into what I call this all or nothing thinking. So I really want you to be careful with that. Things rarely are just that black and white. You probably tell yourself so many stories that start with if, then. I would really work on challenging that narrative. In Rose, for you, perfectionism, it's often going to be about that avoidance of vulnerability. So you have to be sure that you're going easy on yourself by allowing yourself to be vulnerable in the places and spaces that are safe to do so. Journaling is a really great spot for this. And remember, anyone listening, those of you who are worried about the privacy of journals, you can always privacy protect a digital document if you're worried that your private thoughts might be made public. Vulnerability is always going to happen at your pace and as you feel comfortable. I have a lot of different grounding techniques, and anyone struggling with hypervigilance, you'd probably do well to create a habit out of using those grounding techniques. Rose, I'm going to link them up in the show notes for you as well. Now, Blanche, as I round this out and wind this episode down, I really hope that you feel seen in this conversation and that the feedback I've offered applies to you. I rescanned your letter as I wrap this up, and I'd like to think that I have done right by you as well. Thanks to all of you for being in this conversation with me and for sharing this space and this really hard conversation. Dorothy, I'm still talking to you next week. You're not the only one struggling with alcohol right now, and I want that to be its own conversation. This is a community of women around the globe, ladies. Truly, we have people listening in Tunisia, Algeria, Peru, all over. You're all in this together, and I am in it with you. Bye for now. I'm so grateful that you're here. You're right where you're supposed to be. At its heart, I'm hoping to use this show to build a community of women working together to heal from childhoods marked by maternal narcissism and emotional neglect. My goal for Mother Mayhem is that this show becomes an advice and mentoring-driven show where you share your questions, struggles, and stories, and I offer you direction for healing and recovery. That can't happen without your contributions. I invite you to send a recorded voice memo or write in an email with your questions and things you're struggling with. You can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. To connect further, I invite you to find me over at Instagram and occasionally on TikTok at daughtersnpd. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, I'm going to ask that you share the show with her. You can help me get the word out with your reviews and social shares of the show and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing this show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks for your time today. I'm always in it with you. Bye for now.